reading this morning it comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, and verses 17 to 33. This passage is also the basis for the message this morning. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grievous, that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are Fifty righteous people in the city. Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find fifty righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry. But let me speak just once more. What if only ten can be found there? He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. I draw your attention again to verse 25, where we read, Will not the judge of all the earth do right. Well, this is quite a passage. There are three major themes in this passage to which I want to draw your attention this morning. We need to understand the sin of Sodom. We need to examine the prayer of Abraham. And we need to contemplate the one who is the judge of the whole earth. We'll look at his character and his response, both to Sodom's sin and to Abraham's prayer. Now before we unpack this passage, it's helpful to gain some insight into the background. In Genesis chapter 18, we read about a rare and memorable event. Now, sometimes we have rare things happen to us, or we have a chance to participate in something highly unusual, and it kind of sticks with us. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to be in North Carolina at the Wheels Through Time Museum. It's a museum filled with early American motorcycles. And one of the unique things about this museum is that all of the motorcycles in this museum can run. And uh, the owner of the museum moves about during the course of the day, and from time to time, he'll fire up one of these ancient machines and let it run, and let people listen. Well, I happened to be there on the day that he started 
the rarest motorcycle <coughs> in the world. It's called a Traub, T-R-A-U-B. There is only one Traub motorcycle in all the world. So it was quite a privilege to hear that motorcycle built in 1916, fired up while I was there in the museum. That was a, a rare and memorable event. The origins of the motorcycle are somewhat obscure. It was found behind a false wall in a residential building in Chicago in the 1960s. They're not for sure who built it, but it's well ahead of its time in terms of the technology that it incorporates. Quite a thing. One of the theories is that it was built by two brothers, German Jews who came to America and then uh, changed their name so it would sound more German, thinking that that would get them more acceptance. But then the First World War happened, and being German wasn't such a hot idea, so they hid the motorcycle so that it wouldn't be taken for the war effort. There's also a story that it was stolen by a young man who was later drafted into the army. He hid it before he left and never returned. Now, we're not sure about those stories, but what I do know is that this is one very rare motorcycle, and I got to hear it run. Now, that was rare, and that was memorable, but that was nothing compared to the experience that Abraham had he actually had the opportunity to host God for a meal. That's really what's described in the first part of Genesis chapter 18. It was a one-time event, unique in human history. It says in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 1, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. When you look at that verse, Lord is spelled capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is the way that they indicate that it was Yahweh, the one true God, who came in human form to meet with Abraham. Verse 2 says that there were three men. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. As we read further through Genesis, we discover that two of them were angels. That is clarified in chapter 19 and verse 1. The two angels, it says, arrived at Sodom in the evening. So, three men. One was the Lord, Yahweh, in human form. The other two were angels. Now, Abraham was famous for his hospitality. Good thing, because on this occasion, he had a unique opportunity to host God himself. Abraham is told that he's going to have a son in his old age. Sarah, his wife, is going to have a baby. Now Sarah is listening in. She's listening through the tent wall. And she knows that she is way past childbearing age. And so when she hears this, she laughs. She laughs to herself. And the Lord says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? You ever tempted to laugh when God makes a statement that that just couldn't happen? There is just no way. Sarah laughed, and, uh, and God says, why did Sarah laugh? And Sarah says, oh, I didn't laugh, but you can't fool God. God says, yes, you did laugh. In chapter 18, verse 16, it says, when the man got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. And you just picture, here's Abraham walking with the Lord and a couple of his angels. And they're moving towards Sodom. 
Now the first description of Sodom in the Bible is found in Genesis 13, 13. And this is what it says about Sodom. It says, Now the people of Sodom were wicked and sinning greatly against the Lord. Abraham had such intimacy with God that the Lord shares his plans with Abraham. God knows the plans he has for Abraham. He knows that he intends to make his descendants into a great and powerful nation, a nation that will be a blessing to <coughs> all the nations of the earth. You've all heard stories that go something like this. I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news. Right? That's kind of the situation here for Abraham, except this story is no joke. He's just been told that he's going to have a son who's going to be the first of a multitude of descendants. But now, God has some bad news to share with Abraham. In chapter 18, verses 20 and 21, the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sins so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that is reached. God is about to judge Sodom and its sister city of Gomorrah for their sin. In fact, things have gotten so bad that God intends their total destruction. God is angry as heaven, and he's not about to take it anymore. Abraham had such intimacy with God that God knew he could trust Abraham with this plan. And so he shares his intentions with Abraham. Now, before we go any further, I need to emphasize that what happened here is a literal historical event. There are many references to it, both in the Old and the New Testament, including in the teaching of Jesus himself. So let's talk about these major themes. The sin of Sodom. What exactly was it? Well, there is a description of what happened when the angels got to the city of Sodom. I am aware of the fact that we have children in the congregation this morning, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But the Word of God does spell out some things that we need to give our attention to. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50, it says, God is speaking here, this was the sin of Sodom. They were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them, as you have seen. They were haughty and arrogant. So first of all, these people were guilty of pride. Pride is the root of all kinds of evil. We might even say that pride is the original sin. Pride was the thing that made the devil the devil. He started out as Lucifer. He became Satan when pride got the best of him. And then the passage goes on to highlight things like gluttony and materialism, idleness and irresponsibility. They did not help the poor and needy. They were selfish people. And they did detestable things in God's sight. A reference to sexual perversion. Jude verse 7 says, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. Now the dictionary defines perversion as a deviation from normal sexual behavior, especially homosexuality or other abnormal sexual practices. Notice the progression here, from pride to pollution to perversion. And now we come to the prayer of Abraham. Genesis chapter 18, picking it up, in verse 22, the men turned away, that's referring to the two angels, and went towards Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. You can almost picture Abraham here. The Lord is about to go off towards Sodom, and Abraham gets in front of him. Stops him. He's got something he wants to say to the Lord. Notice Abraham's prayer. He starts praying. Prayer, after all, is just talking to the Lord, right? That's what prayer really is. Just 
talking to God. And that's what Abraham does here. And he asks God for some very specific things. He asks him to spare the city if there are some righteous people there. He starts with 50. If there's 50, God, can you spare them? And God consents. 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. I want you to notice Abraham's prayer. It was courageous. It takes guts to remain standing before the Lord. It does. How would you feel if you were face to face with God? He says, I'm going to do such and such. And you said, hold on, God. Let me talk to you about this. It was a courageous prayer. It was a contrite prayer. In other words, a prayer where he recognized his own insignificance compared to God. He says in verse 27, I am dust and ashes. I'm nothing compared to you, God. But he counts on God's compassion. It's a compassionate prayer because he's praying not for himself, but for others. And it is a confident prayer. In verse 25 he says, Will not the judge of all the earth do right? He appeals to God's character. The Bible says that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And this prayer of Abraham was powerful and effective. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 29, it says, So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had Lot was singed, but he was saved. Now, if there was anything wrong with Abraham's prayer, it was that he may have stopped to soon. What if he had asked God to spare Sodom if there were only five righteous people there? What if he had asked God to spare Sodom if there was only one? We are not told what would happen. But we do know that there was one righteous man in Sodom. That was Abraham's nephew, Lot. According to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, it says, God rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. He was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Now we don't have a lot of detail there, but it strikes me that Lot was, was upset about it, but it doesn't say that he ever did anything about it. It doesn't say that he ever prayed about it. That was kind of left to Abraham. Sometimes we can be distressed about the evil that we see going on in our society. But do you pray about it? Do you do anything about it? Verse 9 goes on to say, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, it says that Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Sometimes we pray and then we give up. Do not give up praying. Do not give up on your troubled marriage. Do not give up on your rebellious child. Do not give up on your godless neighbors. And do not give up on your sinful nation. Keep on praying, asking God to make a difference. Let's talk about the judge of the whole earth. Abraham said, will not the judge of the whole earth do the right thing? We can count on God to do the right thing because God is good. I'm going to ask for some help here, Tim. God is good. Jesus said, no one is good except God alone. That's Luke chapter 18 and verse 19. So what happens if you take God out of good? If you take away the G and the O and the D, what do you have left? A big zero. Nothing. There is no goodness apart from God. He is the only one. He is the source of all goodness. Any goodness that may be found in any of us is really His goodness being released 
to us and through us. God is good. His goodness is revealed by His two primary characteristics. His holiness and His love. God is good because God is holy. And God is good because God is love. We can count on God to do the right thing because God is holy. The Bible says, God speaking, I, the Lord, am holy. <coughs> Be holy, for I am holy. And he says, I make you holy. You need to understand that God will judge sin wherever it is found. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 9 says, They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. Another translation says it this way. They boast about their sins, which are like those of the people of Sodom. They don't even bother to hide them. How horrible it will be for those people, because they have brought disaster upon themselves. In Romans chapter 1, we find a description of what goes on in human societies when God does not receive his rightful place. Romans chapter 1, picking it up with verse 24, it says, Just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but also approve of those who practice them. This describes the situation in Sodom, but it also describes society today. Billy Graham famously said, if God doesn't judge America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. In Canada, too, many sinful practices, for example, the sin of homosexuality, is not only accepted, but actively promoted and openly celebrated. Today in Canada, it is not socially acceptable to warn people that those who engage in a homosexual lifestyle stand in danger of God's judgment. There are some who call us haters for proclaiming God's truth as revealed in the Bible. We are not haters. We are lovers. We love God and we love people. This includes people who are tempted by same-sex attraction and those who are gender confused. In a group this size, it is almost inevitable that there are people dealing with those issues. I want to say today, it is not a sin to be tempted. In any way, it is not a sin to be tempted. Even Jesus was tempted. But we know that he never, ever, not even once, committed sin. I'm sure that there is not an adult or a teenager here who has not been tempted by sexual sin at some point. Unlike Jesus, we have all sinned in many ways. Jesus is a friend to sinners, but he is no friend to sin. Jesus never once ignored or minimized the terrible consequences of sin. We can count on God to do the right thing, because God is love. 1 John 4, 7, God <coughs> is God loves you, and he wants the best for each one of you. Now, to the surprise of some, God is not against sex. In fact, he invented it. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Biblical sexuality is not popular in our sexualized society. The Bible outlines two viable options. One, marriage. One man and one woman in a committed marriage relationship. Or two, 
a life of chastity as an unmarried single person. And please understand, singleness is not a defect. We are all single at some point in our lives. Jesus lived his whole life on earth as an unmarried man. But any deviation from God's plan is sin. Because God is love, he offers forgiveness for all our sin. The cross of Christ reminds us how much it costs God to forgive us. On the cross, Jesus showed us the full extent of God's love. God was willing to sacrifice his only son to save us. The death of Jesus on the cross, the sacrifice of his body, and the shedding of his blood makes our forgiveness possible. Christ offers forgiveness for everyone, everywhere. Do not hesitate to throw yourself on the mercy of God. God is merciful and loving. That is his nature. In Holy Communion, we partake of the body and blood of Christ. The Bible warns us against eating and drinking unworthily. To eat and drink unworthily means that we fail to recognize what the death of Jesus really means. We fail to confess and forsake all our sin, whether of a sexual nature or otherwise. Point, I'm going to just call for a moment of silence, a time to examine ourselves. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you any unconfessed sin. Admit your sin to God, who loves you, and receive His forgiveness right now. Ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit, and believe that it is done. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You can stand unashamed before the judge of the whole earth as his much-loved son or daughter because he has forgiven you and filled you with his Spirit. Let's pray so. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Forgive our sin. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, I invite you as a child of God to come with joy and gratitude to the table those who are assisting me in the service of communion. Come, join me here at the table as our musical team comes.